What's up family? My name is Felicity and welcome to Congo Talks 243. If this is your first time, I would really encourage you to subscribe first of all, just so you are notified every time that I post a new video. And for those of you family who have been here for a long time, welcome back. I am so glad you're still here. So welcome to today's episode of the pre-colonial kingdoms series. Today is actually our last episode. Sadly. Uh, this is because I'm really limited on on other kingdoms, you know, because the DRC was made up of multiple kingdoms and for some of them I just do not have the right materials to provide information to you guys. So unfortunately, I decided to end the series with the Lunda Empire. Okay, so moving on the Lunda Empire, although it's the largest one the largest kingdom it's also the hardest to study because it's it's very hard to find the right materials to to talk about the lunda kingdom and basically i have gone through fire figuratively speaking to find you guys this information that i'm about to provide to you in this video and uh, i would encourage you guys to do your own research as well maybe you might be able to find something else that i'm i wasn't able to find but i feel like the story of the lunda empire really could be found more in books than just online research so it's been hard but i collected a few facts for you guys that i am about to present to you and i hope that it gives you an idea of what the lunda empire was so without further ado let's go to the so the lunda empire really started at first like a chiefdom and this chiefdom was found in the southern part of the DRC. This chiefdom was made up of some small areas that were led by a group of people known as the Tubung. If it was in a kingdom situation, a Tubung is basically like a king. And the way that they passed on their power from one person to the next was in a matrilineal way. So they would pass it on to their daughters and then their daughters pass it on and it goes that way so on and so forth and according to verbal traditions one of the chiefs named chief Nkond left his office to his daughter and his daughter's name was queen rej and basically queen rej after she took over the office she then got married to chibanda ilunga and chibanda ilunga if you've watched my video on the luba kingdom you would know that he was the brother of kalala ilunga who was the first Bulopwe or the first sacred king of the Luba kingdom. So Chibanda Ilunga then left the Luba kingdom and he went to another, to a chiefdom. And after Chibanda Ilunga married Queen Rej, she decided to hand over her office to him. So after this leadership was handed over to him, he then proceeded to organize his own court that kind of adapted to the Luba method of government. Now, there are two versions of the story about what happened after. The first version is saying that after they got married and the office was handed over to Chibanda Ilunga, they had a son and this son's name was Yav. After Chibanda Ilunga died, power was then given to his son, the son that he had with Queen Rej. And so they named him Mwant Yav. So Mwant Yav just means Lord Yav. And this title was then used by other future kings as well. That is the first version of the story. The second version of the story, which is something that is still practiced today by the Lunda people, is the version where they say that Queen Rej actually could not have children. So in order for her not to jeopardize the succession, what she did is she took another woman for Chibanda Ilunga. And that woman was the one who gave birth to Yav, who became the first Mwant Yav. And basically, according to history, these two women were then institutionalized. So basically what that means is that at the court of the Muantiav, you would always find two women that represent Queen Rej and also that represent the mother of the first king, Yav, or the mother of the first Muantiav. The first woman is usually referred to as Swan Murund or Swana Mulunda. And basically what she represents is she represents societal fertility because although she could not give birth biologically, she gave birth to the empire. So she was respected for that factor. And the second woman is usually referred to as Rukonkesh or Lukonkesha. And basically what she represents is she represents biological fertility. And no Mwantyav has been able to reign or has been able to rule without these two women at the court. So the representation of the Lunda society was based on positional succession and also on perpetual kinship. And basically what this meant is that 
every person who succeeded another into a position or a title had to almost become his predecessor so he had to take the name of his predecessor his predecessor's character would become his his character and also the personality of his predecessor had to also almost become like his own personality as well so in a way it was very easy to imagine to imagine this empire as basically a state run by family members even though it was not literally a family that was leading this empire the fact that the current leaders had to take the personalities and the names of their predecessors made it seem like like that and it still continues today so the empire started expanding itself around the 18th century and basically the expansion came as a result of the Lunda kingdom's trading relationships with other neighboring states they had an incredible military power so basically what happened is sometimes when they would go in their trading quest they would impose themselves on already existing societies and they would create their own chiefdoms and things like that and over time the lunda empire really became like a federation because even though it was ruled by one king who was the Muantiav, it was ruling over the different chiefdoms that were relatively independent and basically what these chiefdoms had to do is they had to pay tribute to the Muatiav. So at the end, what happened is that the empire was invaded by the Chokwe. The Chokwe people also had their own kingdom. So they invaded the Lunda Empire and they were armed with guns. So they took over and they created their own system of government, brought their own languages and practices and things like that. But even though they invaded this empire, the Lunda chiefs and people still resided in the Lunda heartland. But of course, as, as would be expected, their power was diminished. So that is all for today's video, guys. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you are new, be sure to subscribe just so you are notified every time I post these informative videos. Also, let me know what you would like to see next on this channel. Like, is there any topic suggestions that you guys would want me to incorporate? Just let me know and your wish is my command. I shall do it and we will all learn together. But well, thank you so much for coming with me in this series and I hope that you learned one thing or two and I shall see you guys very soon.